This week, I'm joined by Theodore Dalrymple, who is a writer and retired prison doctor and psychiatrist. He has written multiple books, including Life at the Bottom, The World View That Makes the Underclass, and Spoilt Rotten, The Toxic Cult of Sentimentality. In this episode, we're going to discuss existentialism, meaning, responsibility, and his book, The Terror of Existence, From Ecclesiastes to the Theatre of the Absurd, which he co-authored with Kenneth Francis. If you wish to support Hermetic's podcast, please find links below for our Patreon and merchandise pages. Enjoy. Theodore Dalrymple, thank you very much for joining us on Hermetic's. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so just before we jump into the Hermetic's question, uh, if you if you could possibly give a... For the, for the listeners who aren't familiar with your work or, or your life, which is very much uh, entwined with your work, is there any possibility there you could give a brief overview of, of your path to where you like... yes well i i'm uh, or was a doctor i'm retired now i was um, a doctor who had worked uh, and traveled extensively um, in the world i i crossed africa by public transport for example um uh, but i Latterly was a psychiatrist and a doctor in a prison and in an inner city hospital. And uh, all these experiences have affected uh, my writings and my work, as of course they would, really. <laughs> um, so I used to have a, uh, when I was quite a bit younger, a slight penchant for uh, political danger. So I enjoyed going to civil wars. And then when I returned uh, uh, to England, I found uh, uh, I was horrified, really, by the level of uh, social degradation and violence uh, in everyday life in quite a large part of uh, the British uh, population or the English population. Mm -hmm. uh, what years? Uh, what years was it when you when you made the the when you left and when you made the return? Well, I was in England on and off uh, really most of my life, but I did spend four years in Africa, three years in in the South Seas, and about a year in Latin America. Uh, and I came back really more or less in permanently in 1990. Though I, contrib I continued to travel quite a lot, and I would. Uh, for example, I, uh, under a different name, I wrote a book about the peripheral uh, communist countries, but they were short visits rather than uh, lengthy stays, uh, short visits to places like North Korea. So I've been based in Britain really since uh, 1990, but continue to travel. Now I travel much less. I think that's uh, a clear enough overview for us to, to, to begin. So we begin with this... Um question that's been devised specifically for this this podcast which is um a way to kind of see see what it is you're looking at at the moment and the overarching questions in your thought and we do this by the way of um a question which is if you could place three thinkers living or dead within a room and listen in on the conversation uh, which three thinkers would you pick well, it depends what you mean by thinkers, but I would quite like to listen to uh, Dr. Johnson's uh, view of the current situation. I would uh, like uh, to listen to uh, uh, Simon uh, Lay's uh, talking about uh, current life, and I suppose I would like, uh, I might like uh, to hear uh, Dickens as well. I don't know whether they count as thinkers. Um, certainly, they they thought a lot. Uh, um, uh, I would like to, to to hear them discuss our current travails. Uh, since uh, Simon Lee's, I don't know whether how familiar people would be with Simon Lee's, but he was a a wonderful Belgian Australian sinologist who, in the nineteen eighties, was possibly the well, certainly he was the most famous sinologist to to oppose, to, to, to describe the horrors of the Cultural Revolution, um, much to everyone's, well, the, the sinologist's uh, disgust. And, of course, he was completely right. But as it happens, he was also an extremely good, in fact, the 
the best that I know. He was uh, an extremely good literary uh, critic and uh, essayist. And he had a wonderful way of condensing uh, profundity in uh, amusing uh, and very short uh, essays. It's interesting that you've picked them for the purpose of analysing the present. A lot of people have picked if historical thinkers um, so they could so they could kind of pick their brains in terms of their thought in their own time. But when you mention our uh, as kind of an assumption there of our contemporary contemporary uh, travails as you put it what what is that that you're you're alluding to there well I, I mean all all societies and all times have their travails of course um, and I think one of the things that strikes me about the the modern world is the extreme contrast between our, um, our technical sophistication our relative wealth of course uh, it's unprecedented really that, that there should be no real hunger uh, that many many people should be able to earn in an hour or two enough to eat for completely unprecedented and yet there is this feeling that there is something profoundly wrong with the lack of meaning in life uh, I think these people would be uh, would be interested in that and would have something illuminating to say about it. What was the time that you see before we moved into this um, kind of, you know, meaningless contemporary um, society? What was the transition there? Did, was there a certain point where you started noticing, was it that first return to the UK or was there other things you began to see? Well, I began to think about I, I began to think about it when I uh, returned to uh, to Britain, and I saw people um, destroying themselves, destroying their lives for no external reason. I mean, I'd been to civil wars where, of course, I'd seen terrible things and, and that absolute misery, but it seemed to come from outside, as it were. Um, but in Britain, I saw people uh, a, a level of self-destruction, which I I hadn't really thought about before uh, and I wondered how it had arisen how it had arisen, why it was there and one of the questions I used to ask patients and which produced quite a quite a panic stricken response was what are you interested in? a very simple question and people found it a very difficult um question to answer and uh, they would uh, search around their minds for something to say and quite a lot of them would end by saying shopping and of course I thought that wasn't really uh, uh, a very satisfactory answer I mean I would define contemporary shopping as I see it on Saturday in any large city in Britain as the uh, as the insolvent in, in pursuit of the unnecessary. <laughs> and um, uh, this started me to think uh, about uh, the emptiness, actually, that people experience, and which, incidentally, quite interestingly, to me anyway, is the theme of uh, the contemporary French uh, novelist Michel Welbeck. I don't know whether everyone has, uh, all the listeners have uh, uh, read Sub him. submission and then whatever uh, atomized yes yeah. well th this kind of problem is his uh, his theme now of course he deals not necessarily with the the people at the bottom of the social scale but rather intellectuals and people without really any financial or other apparent difficulties uh, he is his um, theme is the the apparent meaningless, the lack of transcendence of modern life. However, however uh, prosperous it appears. Mm -hmm. the, the you 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 see uh, Hulenbeck as as one of the best art articulators as of this kind of contemporary meaningless. Is that? I think he's he's very good. I, I, his books are in a sense. Uh, uh, limited 
because the theme is always the same, but he has he's very good at the variations on the theme, and he he sees uh, the absurdity of, of of a great deal of uh, modern existence. He he's he, his protagonist is always the same kind of person. It's a, a well-educated uh, man um, approaching middle age or middle age who has no financial problems and yet has a, a deep sense of, uh, of meaninglessness, of drifting in the world. Um, before we, before I kind of ask the bigger questions on, on, on this meaning uh, on, on meaning in general, because they're they're the quite the they're the overarching large questions. I'll just kind of dive out because um, I did want to talk about your latest book, which is uh, co-written with Kenneth Kenneth Francis, uh, called "The Terror of, of Existence: uh, Ecclesiastes yeah. t- uh, to the Theatre of the Absurd." Um, yeah. Actually, what... may I just uh, interrupt yeah. and say yeah. it isn't my latest book because my oh. latest book is about. Um, it is about the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a chronicle of the England, New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most important medical journals in the world, uh, pointing out um, that it is full of errors and omissions, and in some cases, political correctness. Uh, and and, uh, and but I think this is a significant phenomenon. But anyway, we we'll return to the 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 book, the terror, the terror of existence. Uh, okay, I do apologise. I, I checked a, a big bibliography. It clearly wasn't very. Up- How uh, recent is is uh, the other text? The other book is uh, was published in June this year. Okay, uh, and where where could listeners uh, purchase that if they so wish? Well, the same place as they would purchase uh, Amazon. <laughs> I, I regret to say the easiest place is Amazon, uh, and I'm sure Waterstones and so on. But I, don't, I think they are unlikely to find it in the shelves of their local bookshop. Mm-hmm. Um, so to return to the terror of existence. have one. Uh, so to return to the terror of existence. Um, a question to begin, which is um, quite a strange one, because this is, this is a text which is um, a collection of essays on uh, existential works. So thinkers such as uh, Camus or uh, Beckett, um, etc. Um, and my question is, to, to collect these works in itself and to write about them and to try and find continually original ways of writing about them, um, is it, do you not see that in itself as um, an existential task, because you're you're trying to find meaning in a collection of meaningless or texts which comment about the inherent meaningless of existence. Uh, was there a strange kind of writing process going on there, or? Well, my uh, co-author, whom I've actually met only uh, once, um, is strongly Catholic. So he has, if you like, a belief in a, in a transcendent meaning uh, to life and the universe and so on, which I don't have. So uh, that is, uh, I, I can't speak for him. For myself, I do think that having some kind of uh, cultural activity, some kind of um, original attempted original um, work in science or in art or in literature, in anything really, in history, in any cultural sphere, um, does help to keep the feeling of um, meaninglessness at bay. Of course, I may be uh, deluding myself, uh, but never, uh, and therefore in that sense being uh, dishonest, um, but no more dishonest than the authors of these works. Because if you really believed the world was us and there was no point to anything, you wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't write uh, uh, the books for pe- other people to write about. But nevertheless, um, uh, I do feel that there's a kind of a meaninglessness to existence that uh, one comes into the world, one goes out of it. Uh, one that's uh, the Kantian idea that one looks up at, in terror at the stars. Uh, one has great difficulty 
um, reconciling one's own self-importance with the complete insignificance of one's own life. You mentioned you mentioned just there that that uh, of course they, these these authors have taken the time to write these books, and so if if their position was entirely true, of course they wouldn't because there'd be no point. So uh, do you do you believe that um, as a position? Uh, nihilism or to be a kind of active existentialist isn't that's not a possibility uh well i i suppose you could say well you make your own purpose man is is a purpose making creature just as he's a problem creature. he's not a problem solving creature creature he's a problem making create creature um and but i think people do want something more than that in the same way as for example when they make an aesthetic or a moral judgment they don't just want to reflect they don't want that moral or aesthetic judgment to be merely a statement about their own minds they want it to to be true but where the uh, the truth of moral judgment or aesthetic judgment lies is a very difficult metaphysical question i I don't think anyone is truly a uh, relativist. I don't think it's psychologically possible to be relativist. And yet when you try to to uh, justify or prove a moral or aesthetic judgment, I think it's, uh, unless I've missed something <laughs> in philosophy, uh, it still puzzles people. I think there's a difference between saying, I find that beautiful, and that is beautiful. I don't think that we don't mean the same thing so, by those two sentences. Do you think that um, existentialism, as it's um, classically written, is making the mistake of assuming a position of kind of absolute truth? Or the, assuming a position wherein there, there, therein lies a possibility of absolute truth? Well, I don't see again how one can escape the attraction of, of truth. It's inherent in our discourse, really, that we believe that we are enunciating or trying to enunciate a truth. And I don't see how one can escape that. I found it interesting that uh, your your older work, which obviously deals with um, the underclass and Britain uh, in a state of kind of degradation, um, that completely ties in with with this with this text and one of the things which you've written about time and time again um especially in spoiled rotten uh was was this connection between meaning and purpose and and responsibility and by and large personal agency um do you think that the kind of the the clearest place where the the people that you were treating at the time in the uk where their meaning was lacking that they simply couldn't take personal responsibility for their actions well if you if you look at the possible sources of meaning for people uh, one of course is the struggle for existence if you have a real struggle for existence then uh, the question of meaning doesn't arise you're just struggling to survive and one of the attractions actually in uh, my youth or comparative youth uh, of danger was that when you're in danger there are no other there are no other questions. Um, the danger settles all questions for you, uh, and the situation um, uh, is so absorbing uh, that uh, no other questions arise. Um, but anyway, there is no struggle for existence for most people. In fact, uh, I once asked someone in the Netherlands, what would you have to do in the Netherlands to starve to death? without deliberately trying to starve yourself, that is. And, of course, it's impossible. You couldn't starve yourself to death in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no... Uh, struggle for existence can't give people any meaning or, or, or any success or any feeling of uh, achievement. Then there's religious belief. And religious belief in Britain and France is almost dead. And irrespective of whether you're religious or not, the fact is it does give people a sense of meaning and transcendence. 
Uh, then there's possibly uh, political beliefs. Uh, Marxism is an obvious example. And whatever you think of Marxism, uh, and I didn't think very much of it, but, but it does give people a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. They are part of the, once they've accepted the doctrine and, and so on, they feel themselves to be part of, uh, a part of a transcendent history, uh, which has a teleology, as it were. Uh, but very few people now have any, uh, sense of, of a purpose like that. And one of the, uh, they try to manufacture them, and there's a kind of balkanization of that purpose. So, uh, we have various kinds of fanaticism. Uh, but, um, but it's not, on the whole, that's not very convincing. Then there's artistic or scientific, philosophic endeavor. But this is really possible only for a very small uh, proportion of the population. Uh, I don't know what proportion of the population, but a very small proportion of the population. And they don't really have any self-generated cultural activity. They are rather now, people are rather now passive recipients of, of cultural products. They don't participate in the way that uh, Morris dance was used to participate, or they don't participate in anything else. So they don't have any of those possibilities of finding meaning. Uh, they don't really have any possible uh, meaning in the continuation of their families, because there are no families. I mean, families are just associations of people that are more or less temporary. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what, is, what then is left? And actually, I came to the conclusion, this isn't a scientific conclusion, and that people could say, well, I demand evidence for what you're saying, uh, and I can't give you firm evidence. But I thought that quite a lot of social pathology uh, arose from an attempt uh, to fill a vacuum. It puzzled me why, for example, women often seem to like very, very bad men, and men who were obviously bad. I mean, you you would know they were bad the moment they came through the door. And the women would admit that 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 was so. Um, And the fact is that they preferred a life of continual crises, self-generated and miserable though it was, to a life which just went along in a flat, uh, completely uninteresting way. They preferred being in a soap opera, even if it was a very unpleasant soap opera, to being uh, just living, existing, uh, maybe a bit more comfortably, uh, without crises. Mm -hmm. So the crises gave a meaning to their life. And they, people did things which were quite obviously uh, disastrous and self-destructive. And they knew in advance that they were uh, disastrous and self-destructive. And so that that now is not so much our our meaning, but uh, the, the reaction people take in a in a world where it's nigh impossible to even you know kind of grasp onto the tiniest bit of meaning, so you just kind of people are doing things for the for the sake of uh, kind of thrill or some danger. Yes, yes, I think so, and that's why, of course, extreme sports are, are more common than ever before. And uh, if you observe behaviour in um, at least this is my feet. And again, I can't prove it. If you wanted scientific proof, I couldn't give it to you. But when I observe the uh, English enjoying, the young English people enjoying themselves and drinking themselves into um, oblivion, as it were, but in the meantime making a, a terrible nuisance of themselves, I see in their supposed enjoyment something almost hysterical. Uh, the screaming and laughing, which is almost an attempt to persuade themselves, this is how I interpret it, uh, 
uh, an attempt to persuade themselves that they're having a wonderful time rather than that they are having a wonderful time. And several times I've heard intelligent young people saying that they had a wonderful night last night and the evidence that they had a wonderful uh, night last night was that they can't remember anything about it, which is a rather difficult <laughs> view of the possibilities of human enjoyment. And incidentally, in the days when the Daily Mail uh, sent, I was briefly their vulgarity correspondent, as it were, there was the official title, but that's what I was, and they would send me to places where, people, where young British people were gathering and behaving badly, which was almost everywhere where they were gathering. Um, they sent me to Ibiza. Mm-hmm. And I don't know whether you've ever been to a beef. I haven't. Uh, no. Um, well, uh, there are two giant nightclubs there. Uh, one is called Amnesia, and the other is called Manumission. And of course, Manumission is being freed from slavery, and the other is forgetting. And it seems to me, uh, and they are huge. I mean, they're not like nightclubs when I was a, a very young person when the nightclubs were rooms where there were tables with with pink uh, tablecloths and people put round buckets uh, with champagne in it and all that kind of thing. There was nothing like that. There were thousands and thousands of people and it seemed to me that they were actually trying to forget themselves. And and what they were forgetting, it seemed to me, was not the intolerability of of their material existence, because by comparison with all other uh, groups of people who have ever existed on Earth, they they lived a comfortable uh, existence. Uh, but the fact that they didn't know how to live or what to live for. These um, nightclub kind of escapades and, and the culture of binge drinking and sort of un, unalloyed hedonism, um, this ties in with, with the idea that you have, which is um, a lot of these actions taken um, by the underclass or by the people in these positions uh, it, it is, is resentment. Uh, well, some of it's resentment. But incidentally, I don't really like the, the term underclass because it implies that there's a very clear uh, group of people who are different from all the other people, shall we say 5% of the population, who behave in a completely different way from the rest of the population, and who are um, impoverished. Well, people who go to Ibiza and um, go to these nightclubs and drink and so on are not impoverished. Uh, they're financially impoverished, I mean. And um, so I don't really like the, the term underclass because I'm not, I wasn't intending to write, uh, uh, you know, about a, a lumpen proletariat or anything like that. That was right. Well, I was writing about contemporary British culture, which I think you can see uh, absolutely uh, everywhere you look. Yes, resentment. I don't. Uh, when I ask people, another very difficult question for people is, uh, what would you do if you suddenly had a lot of money? Because if you say, I don't like my current life, uh, and my current life is no good, uh, what is it that would make your life better? And if you ask them, they may feel that there's economic um, injustice and so on. And if you say, well, you suddenly have a lot of money, what would you do? What what would your life be like? And actually what you find, or what I found when I asked people that, was that what they wanted, what the only thing they could think of, actually, not that they particularly wanted it, was their current life, but on a more grandiose scale. So that they would drink more, or they would have a larger house, or um, they would go on a, an exotic holiday, or something like that. But actually, the fundamentals of their existence wouldn't change at all. They wouldn't know really what to do. And that's why, of course, many people who win the lottery um, are, are not gloriously happy uh, for very long. 
because they don't actually have anything that they really want to do or any way that they really want to live. I'm right in saying that 70% of uh, lottery winners become bankrupt within five years of winning, so um, I think yes. that's kind of a... Of course, you could say, what what happens to the other 30%? Uh, I don't know, but uh, but certainly, I mean, that was uh, uh, the... Uh, the thing that struck me very much was that, that that all they would do is live their current life, but on a slightly bigger scale of consumption. That's all they could think of. And, th- and that ties into the, the the other difficult question you were asking your patients, um, which they often replied, you know, shopping. And it seems that consumption then is is the closest we're getting to at least a clear way of of articulating what meaning is in in, in um, I don't want to use the word underclass, but but um, I was using that just to uh, group. The yes, people. Well, one of my books is it has a subtitle uh, about the underclass. It wasn't of my, it wasn't of my choosing. Ah, I don't, okay. as I said, I didn't really like I don't really like the concept actually. But anyway, go on. Yes. Yeah. So so consumption. Do you see any uh, from a psychological point of view? Do you see any? specific reason that consumption is so meaningful to people or is it really just an empty kind of um, uh, activity which which just gives you gives you dopamine well i don't want to pose as a, a kind of ascetic who lives uh, on locusts and honey uh, in the syrian desert somewhere because that would be ridiculous i'm not I'm not extremely rich, but I'm not extremely poor either, and I have no desire to be poor. I I like physical comfort, and I like uh, good food, and so on and so forth. So I'm not um I, I'm not um uh, posing as a as a, a, a as a uh, one of the fathers of the church who was completely indifferent to um, to material consumption. But on the other hand, I don't. I certainly haven't made it the focus of my existence. Um, so I'm not completely indifferent to material well-being. But that's not quite the same as spending your spare time uh, looking for things which actually won't make you any happier. Uh, and this is a problem from top to bottom of society. It's not just people at the lower level. I was uh, once in Beverly Hills in in California, and I observed people who are obviously extremely rich going into very, very expensive and exclusive shops and department stores, and they had the most miserable faces. And they came out, and they were miserable. And they came out with things which presumably they must have wanted uh, at least for a few seconds or possibly a few minutes. But the idea that this would actually bring them any meaning uh, or give them any purpose uh, was preposterous. And actually, insofar as there is propos- uh, the meaning, uh, meaning or purpose in what they were doing, it was to find fault with what they purchased and with what they had in the hope that buying something else would provide the meaning that they hadn't found in whatever they'd bought before. This all kind of strangely ties together in that, uh, the, you know, Ibiza and and, and uh, these groups of people just kind of being pulled into what sounds to me like a sort of hell, to be quite honest, these nightclubs, uh, and being kind of just pulled by these, I guess you could say, forces, the same with consumption and shopping. Um, and this ties in with one of the, I guess, the more controversial things you've written. Of course, there is many. Um, but uh, the, the, the idea of um, the knife went in, which is, uh, of course, some of your uh, people that you dealt with in psychiatric hospitals, when they'd stabbed people, they, they didn't kind of admit to any per- personal agency. They, they stated it in the way that the knife went in, as if um, uh, at least... If you if 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 I was to read to read that in a, at least some sort of metaphorical way, I'd say that I could see that as um, a statement that it's almost as if the culture that's taken the person with it is in charge. In the same way that these people who consume all the time, it seems that all person personal agency out, is out the window, and we're actually being controlled by the material. Yes, well, I, I yes, I, I think we all 
I think we all do it to some extent. I would be very surprised if you'd never uh, blamed uh, forces outside yourself for your own failings, because I've certainly done that, and I think those people do do it at some time. The, the question is to what extent they do it, um, and whether they ever bethink themselves so that they uh, stop doing it. The knife went in uh, is an interesting example, and it, actually I, what I discovered was that almost every person who stabbed someone to death, at least in the prison in which I worked, put it that way when, our, when asked what, what happened. They say the knife went in as if the knife were the agent and the hand uh, did not guide the knife. The knife guided the hand, as it were. Uh, but this put them in an odd psychological position because, of course, at some level, they knew, of course, that this was perfectly well, absurd. They, they knew it was not so. And yet, in a certain way, they were given rewards for alleging that they were uh, not agents, but the vector of forces, as it were. And this is a, this was uh, perhaps a more important example is that of addiction, particularly addiction to heroin, which became very prevalent while I was working. Um, and people, would, if, if uh, asked, why did you start taking heroin? People would say, I fell in with the wrong crowd as if there were a, uh, a form of um, social gravity. But when you actually analyze what, it, what was necessary for them to become an addict, what you find is that most such addicts uh, took heroin on and off for about 18 months before they became physically addicted. They had to learn where to get the heroin. They had to learn how to prepare it. They had to learn how to inject it. And actually injecting yourself with something is not something, is not a, is not a pleasant thing uh, to have to learn. And most people would have an inhibition against it. So you have to overcome an inhibition in order to do it. Uh, they have to learn to disregard, uh, the unpleasant side effects of heroin. And yet they presented themselves as if their addiction was something that happened to them rather than something that they did. And unfortunately, the medical profession and other professions have reinforced that by claiming that addiction is simply a physiological condition um, that just happens to you rather like Parkinson's disease or rheumatoid arthritis. It's not, it just that's what happens to you, you get addicted. Um, and it comes out of the blue. And this is nonsense. And it's dangerous nonsense because it disguises from the person his own agency and also uh, prevents him from taking agency, which is the only way he will overcome his addiction. And many patients, for example, said to me, I would stop if I got the help. In other words, and what they meant by the help was that there was some technical treatment, some technical maneuver or procedure which would stop them taking the drug without them having to decide anything. The doctor could just stop it for him. And this, it seemed to me, not only was it not true empirically, uh, but it was complete philosophical nonsense. So this idea that they almost revel uh, uh, and enjoy being the most downtrodden and the most, um, almost the most kind of cosmically unlucky. And, and it seems that, especially in Spoilt Rotten, you wrote, you wrote about this a lot, that people will, people will actually go to extreme lengths to not only prove that they're sort of extremely downtrodden, but they will, they will almost exacerbate it do you think this is they purposefully exacerbate their their um, bad luck, or or is it subconscious almost desire to uh, to seem that way? Well, I suppose there's a kind of romanticism to it. I, uh, as you were talking, I thought of a particular prisoner, who of course I can't mm -hmm. um, can't name, uh, but whose goal 
in life was to be the worst and most difficult prisoner in the British or English prison system. And he was indeed extremely difficult, uh, and so difficult that he he was um, uh, sent from prison to prison. No prison would take him for longer than uh, two weeks because he it was he he made himself too difficult. And that was a kind of goal he set himself because he wanted to distinguish himself. And he couldn't distinguish himself in any worthwhile or, um, sphere, or sphere that, uh, at any rate, most people would consider uh, worthwhile. So he distinguished himself in, in, a, in a way which was completely worthless. But he was at least distinguished. He was not just uh, going to work nine to five, leading an ordinary life, an obscure life of uh, quiet desperation. Mm-hmm. He 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 did he did become important in a kind of way. And I reflected also on the phenomena such as tattooing, which I noticed. Um, I think that was quite relatively quick to notice that tattooing was ascending the, lo- uh, the social scale. At one time, tattooing uh, a tattooed person was almost declaring his own marginality. He was either, he might be a sailor, in which case that was more or less socially acceptable. Uh, most criminals were tattooed. Um, uh, but then it started um, ascending the social scale, and now it's reached the point where I think something like 30% of uh, British adults are tattooed, and in certain age groups it's probably more than that. And this is quite sudden. And I wondered, what, what on earth did it mean? This sudden, it's more than just a fashion, it's more than a tie being thin or wide or brightly colored or very sober. It's something more, much more important than that. And I wondered what it actually meant. And uh, initially, my initial theory, I read a book uh, by a woman called Dee Mello, I think, uh, called um, Bodies of Inscription. And she said that people were trying to express themselves and be individual by, by tattooing themselves. And I dare say there's something in that, though if that's your way of expressing yourself, I would say you don't have much to express. Um, but anyway, I thought there was still, at the time, there was still something antinomian about it. It was a kind of act of rebellion, but at the same time, it was uh, joining a group. So you were both trying to individual, individuate yourself and be a member of a group at the same time. Uh, And also, uh, at that time, I thought it was an expression of supposed political virtue, in as much as you were identifying with marginal people who were assumed to be downtrodden and unjustly treated because they were marginal and and generally impoverished. Uh, So I think the... There was a kind of attraction, a nos- if you like, a nostalgie de la boue uh, uh, involved, and there still is. Mm. I, if I say, if I were to say uh, that you were a respectable person, you were probably respectable in the old-fashioned sense that you went to work, uh, that you did your work, that you caused nobody any problem, that you kept yourself clean, uh, and so on and so forth, had no criminal record, um, had no uh, no outstanding characteristics almost, you would take it not as a compliment, but as an insult. Because people wish wish to be seen as kind of dangerous and um, obscure. Well, certainly outstanding in some way. They can't, they, they're not, there's not much uh, not much satisfaction in in in, uh, in leading a, an ordinary, useful, uh, but not outstanding uh, life. And one of the things I've noticed is that um, uh, one of the characteristics of our time, I think, is ambitious mediocrity. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with mediocrity. We need mediocrity. Not everybody can be outstanding, and everyone is mediocre in in much of what he does. There are very few people who are outstanding in every department of human existence. And so there's nothing wrong with mediocrity. What, what is awful is ambitious mediocrity. And I, I see an awful lot of that, uh, which I don't remember. Early, I saw it a lot in hospitals and in, in administration and in power grabbing. Power has become a very, a very, very important thing, possibly because of a lack of meaning, actually. People feel powerlessness uh, much more acutely than they used to, and uh, power became, can, the, the achieving of some kind of power can, uh, can give a meaning to life. And by, by ambitious mediocrity, do you mean people people um, sh- striving to to be almost seen as, um, say, you know, they 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 are extra- powerful or important? Yeah, extrovertly showing that they they're in on it. You know, they've got the tattoos, they've got the the trinkets and luxuries of society. Well, there, there is that, yes. But there's also the exercise of power in, in bureaucracies and so forth and hierarchies. Uh, often, oddly enough, in the name of equality. But, uh, but, but certainly one sees, well, I thought I saw a lot of people who were, who were very ambitious, but actually had no particular a talent or ability. Do you think that there, that then kind of almost false or pseudo ambition? Do you think that kind of came from people consuming too much um, dramatic TV and believing that everyone can be this this kind of? Um... Well, it's possible. Uh, I suppose it's possible, but I think uh, I think uh, destruction of religion, uh, the evaporation of religion. Has quite a lot to do with it. It's interesting that you said earlier on that 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 Britain isn't really a religious country. I mean, a lot of people are, I, at least at least where I am. Perhaps I'm in a fairly um, privileged area, I guess. Um, but I haven't seen much. People still seem to be uh, going to church and practicing religion. But is this then not in the same way as it was before? This is more of a Facade. Well, I, my guess is that you're living in a uh, in um, in a part of the country which is not at all typical. I think Britain is a, an extremely irreligious country. I'm not a religious person. I have no religious belief myself, and I certainly don't want to live in a theocracy. But I, I think what you're describing is a a, a small probably fairly um, uh, uniform uh, town um, but it's certainly not typical of, uh, of of Britain as a whole and if you go to Wales for example Wales used to be a country where there was what to me seemed a rather dismal um, non-conformist uh, religion which was Perhaps full of hypocrisy and uh, and seemed to me horrible in many ways. But on the other hand, it did give a meaning to life, and it's collapsed completely. And you see this in um, physically, in the sense that all the chapels now, none of the chapels, and there are hundreds of chapels, possibly thousands of chapels in um, in Wales, none of them is still a chapel. They're all luxury apartments. All apartments in Britain are now luxury apartments, um, however small and dismal they are. And um, or then, or their pharmacies or nightclubs, but they're not chapels, and no one goes to chapel anymore. And it's what held that society together in in many ways an undesirable uh, fashion. Uh, and I would have hated it. Nevertheless, it's what gave that society its peculiar savour, its unity, 
Uh, it also gave people something to struggle against, something worth struggling against. Uh, now it's just a, uh, uh, it's a society which believes in absolutely nothing, mm. except trying to have a good time. And they're not even very good at that. You see people shopping. You see, pe I mean, this is not just Wales, I'm talking about the whole country. You see people endlessly shopping for clothes. When do you ever see anybody well dressed? practically never what do you make then of of uh, at least as i see it is this the past kind of perhaps 30 to 40 years of of self help which has been targeted towards happiness as yeah. a as a as a almost i don't know i can't really describe but the you know the goal which is just seems to be beyond every cafe and every advert and every um piece of media almost has as its uh, teleology uh, that that happiness is that which we should be striving towards, yet no one can really define it. Um, as a psychologist, did you see this uh, announce itself, or what do you make of it? Uh, well, certainly one. Uh, it's certainly true if you ask people what they want to do or what they want to be, they'll say, I want to be happy. Uh, and, of course, I would say, you know, when when they said that, I said, well, that's not an ambition. Happiness is, um, well, first of all, you, you mainly know that you're happy in retrospect, but first, and secondly, it's a byproduct of, of something else. It's not that, uh, you say, now I'm going to try and be happy. And, uh, and you think, well, if I take these pills, I will be happy. Um, that seems a very reduced idea of um, a proper goal, um, and it's impossible. Uh, you can't aim at being happy. You can only aim at, and I used to tell people um, that uh, they shouldn't try and find themselves, they should try and lose themselves. In losing yourself is happiness, not in finding yourself. Uh, would you, how would you, def what's the difference there between finding oneself and losing oneself? Well, losing oneself is being absorbed in something that you believe to be worthwhile. Uh, and in a sense, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, uh, to justify uh, scholarship in some obscure corner of human knowledge rather than, say, I don't know what, um, gardening or, um, or any other thing. But anyway, you, what you've got to do is lose this sense of yourself, uh, and which is much harder to do. And patients would say, well, how do I do that? And this was the problem, my problem. I don't really know how one goes about it. All I can say is that in my life, I've been very interested in many different things. I've been a kind of serial monomaniac, if you like. But, um, but how you actually start becoming interested in it. If you have no idea of how to get interested in anything, it's very difficult to know how to how to advise someone. And I think this is something that presumably is done early in childhood, just as I, be, I believe it's probable that if a child doesn't learn how to concentrate by a certain age, it probably will never learn to concentrate. And in the same way, if you don't learn how to uh, lose yourself in something that is larger than yourself. If you don't learn that fairly early in life, you will probably uh, never learn it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't. I. How do you explain to someone who actually knows very little and who doesn't look around him and who has all these um, distractions uh, available to him? such as uh, vast television screens everywhere and so on. How do you explain to him how to lose himself? Yeah, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, quite, it's almost teaching, teaching someone how to learn, but very late in their lives. Uh, extremely difficult feat. Um, yeah. Um, so there's, we're getting on for an hour now, so we could, we could begin to wrap this up. But there's, a, there's certain elements... Of um, the the kind of current political situation that I'd like to mention in terms of 
Um, obviously, a lot of, um, should we just say, right wing thinkers. I mean, Roger Scruton is the most, the yeah. latest example of being deplatformed. And obviously, I don't know if you have your own definition of where you are politically uh, or a specific definition. But uh, would I be right in saying that you you uh, are right wing? Well, it depends what you mean by <laughs> right wing. I uh, I don't. I try not to define myself. Uh, too much ideologically, because once you you're put in a um, a certain place, you're, you're expected to have cert, uh, to have mm. um, certain ideas um, and not to think about things independently. It is rather alarming that uh, people, it seems to me now, uh, paint themselves or are painted into corners. And it does seem that we uh, we all are beginning to live in little islands of like-minded people. There's a book in France called La Chibot Francais, in which he says that people of like minds, like education, uh, like taste, are increasingly surrounded by people just like themselves, and they know nobody outside that kind of uh, milieu. And I mean, not long ago, I was having someone, a conversation with someone, a very cultivated, a nice, intelligent, cultivated person, who said, almost with pride, that he didn't know anyone who voted for Brexit. <laughs> now, this, and, and as I said, was, was almost proud of not knowing anybody like that, as if, uh, any, as if people who voted for Brexit had some kind of infectious disease. Um, and this seemed to me a very bad sign that one could be proud of not knowing, uh, any single person of 52% of the <laughs> electorate that voted in one way. I would never say that. It seems uh, almost. I mean, it wouldn't be true. It wouldn't be true. Uh, in my case, anyway, it wouldn't be true, but I, I would never say such a thing. It would, it would strike me as a disaster if it were actually true. Do you, uh, well, this is, this is what I was going to ask you. In your position as someone who, um, uh, could I say an iconoclast, uh, in terms of politics, um, how have you seen the changes, um, and, and, uh, has, uh, has there been any effect on your work, um, come from this kind of recent um, strange form of leftism that we're seeing? No, I mean, I, I can only say that I haven't, I, I certainly haven't suffered the kind of abuse that uh, Roger Scruton has suffered actually more or less throughout his career um, from, the very big, from the very beginning. I haven't suffered anything like that, possibly because nobody's taken any notice of me. Uh, I haven't been important enough to abuse, uh, but I can't say I've suffered any kind of abuse or anything like that. Um, I do view with alarm the increasing hatred that people of different opinions seem to have for one another, as if the only thing that counted in a person's personality or character was his opinion. Mm. So that you take a, someone of a differing opinion as being not merely of a different opinion, but as a bad person or evil, e even evil person or necessarily ignorant and stupid. I mean, there's a temptation to do that, of course, uh, but it's a temptation that should be resisted. And if you want to live in a free society, you have to recognize that people are of different opinions and maybe very virtuous and good people uh, without necessarily sharing your opinion. But I think it's, it's increasingly rare. Yeah. Most definitely. Um, it's, you mentioned evil there, and actually you, you write in um, The Terror of Existence that the exposure of evil is a transcendent goal. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think this ties in? But perhaps this is what the left is doing. They wish to kind of expose all evils so they can finally have their kind of blank uh, slate of pure. Well, I think, uh, I mean, one of the 
one of the problems of utopianism, if you like, or of, of, of expecting too much from politics, is an absence of the of the sense of the tragic dimension of human life and an inability to recognize that we are complex creatures whose whose desires are contradictory and therefore we cannot have a perfectly satisfactory life. This is the theme of Dr. Johnson's book, uh, Rasselas, that there is no perfect life for man and that dissatisfaction is the permanent condition of man. And that sounds... At first sight, that sounds pessimistic, but actually it's consolatory because it it helps you to put your dissatisfactions into some kind of uh, perspective, and you know that actually what you want you want several things, but they are not compatible, and therefore you will always be to an extent dissatisfied, and that is something that I think people are com- quite unaware of. Or, or don't wish to acknowledge. So people need to read more stoicism and understand that suffering uh, suffering is not not only a part of life but actually a key part of life. And it's necessary. And it's on the individual instance of suffering is perhaps avoidable and should be assuaged wherever it is possible. But the idea that there can be a life without suffering is absurd. That seems to be uh, where the left uh, the left target is is towards such a life. But I mean, of course, that's nothing new. That's um, that's that's generally Marxism once again. You know, targeting towards the uh, the utopian dream of. Um, but any or any form of utopianism, yeah. uh, whatever it is, doesn't recognise this this if you like this. I don't know whether it's a flaw in man's nature, but it exists in man's nature and can't really be overcome. So that on the one hand, you'll, you'll want excitement, but on the other hand, you want security and safety. And these two things aren't really <laughs> compatible. Um, so unless there's anything else you'd like to add or something that I've commented on that I've quickly gone over, uh, I think that's a good place to wrap this up. No, I think that. Thank you very much.